Colorado State University Extension is excited to promote Grow and Give, a modern victory garden project. This project is designed to bring together all 64 counties across the state of Colorado. CSU Extension empowers Coloradans to address important and emerging community issues using dynamic science-based educational resources. What's better than encouraging people to grow their own food and donate the extras? Many Coloradans are starting or restarting gardens this year in response to the COVID-19 situation. As a land-grant university, Colorado State University is excited to promote gardening at home and donating produce locally through a new initiative called Grow and Give Colorado. The whole point is that you will learn to grow food, you'll share the harvest, with the idea of keeping it local. Wherever you are in Colorado, we're local. And the goal here is that you will keep your produce homegrown and local in your community. It's springtime in Colorado and we're all getting excited about getting out in the garden, starting to dig and plant and grow. The purpose of this short training video is to give you an overview of the Grow and Give program early enough in the spring so that you can get planting with confidence knowing that what you plant now can be donated later. My name is Katie Dunker. I'm the Colorado Master Gardener Statewide Coordinator with CSU, along with my colleague Amanda McQuaid, who's a Program Coordinator at the CSU Western Colorado Research Center. We'll be giving you some early considerations for growing to give and details about the project. This presentation is not comprehensive. More resources and guidance will be posted on our website, growandgivecolorado.org. This information will change with the season to keep you up to date with the best practices for growing food in our state. The goals for today are simple. We'll provide an overview of the Grow and Give project. We're going to connect you with CSU's Grow and Give resources and provide practical information you need to get started in your garden. We'll also be offering future trainings and a lot more information on the Grow and Give project and what you can do as a grower. This will include information on how you can connect to emergency food providers in your local area. We'll discuss ways to safely harvest, store, and donate your produce. We'll also be talking about how to celebrate this project, how to record your garden pictures, progress, weigh your donations, and more with the Grow and Give team. Later on, we'll be talking about registering your garden, that's an important piece for us to understand the audience that's participating in the project and to be able to deliver information about future trainings and relevant information that can help you as you're growing to donate. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda McQuaid. I work for Colorado State University at one of our agriculture experiment stations out here in Grand Junction, Colorado. I'm really excited to be a part of this Grow and Give project and this launch today. Um, I've actually been involved in this area for 10 years, first as a volunteer, um, doing what you're doing now. And then now a, um, I manage a farm to food bank program at Colorado State. So I really understand the power of growing your own food and sharing it with others in need. As you know from the news and from um, most likely your own communities, there's a lot of demand right now for services from emergency food providers. So I'd like to stop and actually define that term. Um, there's a lot of different organizations that help provide nutritious food for people all across the state. Um, they may provide meals for people to consume in a communal setting um, or at home. They could provide people with a commodities box that has shelf-stable food, or they could provide a full range of, of food from shelf-stable to fresh, um, like you would find in a food bank or a food pantry. School lunches and breakfasts and after-school snack programs, summer meal programs are really important components um, to address childhood hunger. And so we use the term emergency food provider to describe all of those um, programs because there may be one um, in your community that provides that service. Right now with the COVID pandemic, uh, we're seeing very high levels of use um, at these organizations with an estimated 40% uh, of patrons being first time visitors. 
Um, but the need for food during an emergency doesn't negate the need for that food to be healthy. I think as we all are reducing our trips to the grocery store, we know um, we can relate to what it feels like when we're not eating as much fresh food. And so we want to make sure that uh, people are able to stay healthy, especially in this trying time. Um, so produce has always been a challenge for emergency food providers to acquire, and um, but it's the number one most requested item from pa patrons. And so they're going to be so excited to see your garden grown produce this summer. This grow to give model is new to CSU Extension, but it's certainly not an untested concept. Uh, communities have been responding to hunger like this for a long time through um, efforts such as Plant It Forward in Larimer County, Plants a Row, Backyard Harvest, and Grow Another Row, just to name a few. Um, the exciting thing about this Grow to Give model is that we're going to be able to collect statewide data and really see the impacts that are happening in all of our counties. I'd like to give you a little bit of context about why what you're doing is so important. Uh, hunger is here in Colorado, and it was here even before the pandemic. In 2019, it was estimated that one in 10 Colorado adults and one in 10 Colorado children uh, were hungry. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more information about hunger in Colorado and how Colorado organizations are collectively uh, trying to address it, I encourage you to check out the Colorado Blueprint to End Hunger. It's available on endhungerco.org. Uh, it was published in January 2018 and has some really great um, resources and information. It is our hope that in this project that you are able to get to know the organizations in your community that are doing this really great work and that you help to become a part of that work through your donations. Uh, so we will give you tools later in the growing season to help you identify those organizations. But if you'd like to get an early start, uh, we encourage you to visit Hunger Free Colorado at hungerfreecolorado.org. They have a really great meal finder application that helps you map out emergency food providers in each county. And so if you want an early start, you can go check them out in person or give them a call. So I'm going to transition this to Katie, who is going to explain how all of this will work. So we know there's a need, but how is this going to work? An important first step in joining the Grow and Give project is to register your garden. All Coloradans are invited to join us by registering their home or community garden where they grow food. If you're a Colorado Master Gardener and you're joining this through the volunteer program, you'll register through CMG online. What's the point of registering? Well, if you're registered with us, we'll be able to understand the statewide context and community involved in growing for others. We'll also be able to demonstrate statewide impact and, and understand the value of bringing together multiple gardeners from across the state to provide food for local communities. We're gonna do our best to connect you with local organizations that need your donations. We're also gonna provide access to trainings and resources from Colorado State University. Registration is simple and it's available now at growandgivecolorado.org. Once you've registered your garden, it's time to get growing. So step two is simply grow food. Consider where you'll be planting at home on a patio porch, in a backyard, in ground, perhaps in raised beds, or at a local community garden that's not far from home. If you are going to be working in a community garden, ensure that you understand the current guidelines necessary for working in a community space right now. There's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of changing regulations. Some of the considerations that you may have to take during the pandemic is to wear masks when at the garden, whether you're interacting with others or not. Ensure that you're spread out in the garden for safe social and physical distancing. Bring in your own tools 
or ensuring that tools are properly sanitized after, after use. You'll also want to make sure that you're washing your hands before, during, and after volunteering. These are safe practices that will change likely over the course of this growing season. So stay up to date with wherever you are gardening. If it's at home, it's a little easier to stay on top of those guidelines. You'll be setting them with you and your family and your roommates, uh, but get out in the garden and get growing. You have access to the Grow and Give website now. So take advantage of what we have on our website. We have a lot of information about seed starting, direct seeding, um, considerations for what to plant before the last frost and after the last frost. A lot of information there that's changing and will help you improve your growing over the course of this season. Finally, we ask that you consider sharing pictures with us, telling us your story. What are your garden plans? Um, where are you at with growing now? Are things inside? And you can share some pictures of us, of your seed, with, with us, of your seedlings, etc. So keep us in the loop. We'd love to hear your stories. And if it's something we can share, we'd love to know that too. So email us, growandgive at colostate.edu. And step three is to give. The whole idea of this project is that you would grow for you, your family, yourself, and also growing extra to give. The Grow and Give guidelines will be posted for safely harvesting, storing, and donating your produce soon. We'll also have a training that goes along with that so that you can understand the process. We'll try to keep things simple. We will also work to connect you with organizations that can accept homegrown donations. This will vary based on where you live in the state. Our hope is that you'll be able to donate your produce to an emergency food provider in your area, such as a food bank, a food pantry, a meal site, or a shelter. But we also know that many of you live in rural areas without extensive nonprofit infrastructure. And so you can donate directly to your neighbors or friends in need. Anything you grow, will keep you safer at home. Report your donations and regularly communicate with your local office if you have a relationship developed with the CSU Extension staff in your county. Share your successes, but also any challenges or problems you face. We'd love to hear that too. CSU Extension is all about real time solving real problems. There's likely a few questions that you have about this process. So Amanda will answer those for you. So I'm sure you may have questions throughout the season and we encourage you to check out the Grow and Give website. We may have some good answers uh, there. Uh, but for those of us who have been doing this for a while, we usually encounter three main questions when people are embarking on this type of project. Uh, the first one is whether or not there's any legal liability associated with donating the produce. The simple answer is no. As a donor to a nonprofit organization, you are protected under the Federal Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. Um, so as long as you're giving that food in good faith that the food is safe and edible, you are protected. And a good rule of thumb that we use is that if you're willing to eat what you grow, uh, then it, you're giving it in good faith. If you feel like you need to uh, cook it or cut out the bad spots to make it safe, then that's produce that you should either keep at home or maybe even consider composting. We really wanna donate high quality food um, to emergency food providers not only to demonstrate our gardening superpowers, but also to show that we respect the people who are gonna receive this food and we respect the dignity of the food. So another question is, do they take home preserves like jams or jellies or pickles? Um, the answer is no. So only donate the whole raw food. Um, you even shouldn't plan on doing things like chopping up the lettuce. Um, food banks can't take anything that has been prepped outside a commercial kitchen. Um, and so we'll talk about more on that, um, on the donation side of things at a laser presentation, but just for now, um, save the preserves for your family and neighbors. 
Okay, so the last usual question is, what if squash bugs take over um, and you've signed up to give, um, are you obligated to continue to donate? No, we understand that garden disasters happen. Uh, we hope you reach out to our resources to see if maybe we have some solutions. Um, you can talk to your local uh, agent um, because not only may they have some good tips, but they could also probably connect you with other growing opportunities in your community, like a community garden. So I'm going to transition it back over to Katie, who's going to talk a little bit more about how Extension is going to be supporting this project. So what will be the role of Colorado State University Extension in this project? CSU Extension is here to organize, communicate, document, and celebrate this process. We'll keep track of everyone's donations so we can see the collective impact of our efforts. In large communities where there are a lot of master gardeners and a lot of public donating and also several emergency food providers, we'll also give you resources to connect to organizations and keep communication lines open during this fast changing COVID situation. For those of you in smaller communities, we'll give you information on how you can connect to local organizations that might be accepting and providing food. We're here to answer your questions and help problem solve along the way. We haven't done this in all communities across the state, so bear with us, be flexible. We are trying to do this in a way that provides necessary food from people who are willing to donate and grow. It might be messy, that's okay. And as you would expect from Colorado State University, we're here to provide educational content and support along the way. Our website is the best starting place growandgivecolorado.org. We're here to answer your questions about anything home garden related. And even though most of us can't be in person and doing face-to-face -face programming right now, we've got a lot of programming online. And our master gardeners are still available to answer questions by phone, email, and some counties are even doing live chat. If you scroll to the bottom of our Grow and Give website, you'll see a link that will connect you to your local CSU Master Gardeners. Just look for the Gardening Questions box. Now that you understand the basics of the program, what's next? Well, watch the rest of this training because Amanda will be giving you the specifics about what produce is best for growing and giving in Colorado and other considerations to keep it safe along the way. Register your garden so that we know you're joining the effort to grow and give and start growing. That's it. Finally, wait for further communications from CSU. We'll be sending out additional information, posting more guidance for giving along the way. A big thank you for all the Coloradans out there and the Colorado Master Gardeners who are considering starting, restarting, or continuing to garden um, this season. Your efforts will collectively make a big impact in Colorado. Thank you for joining us. Great, Katie. Um, so what fruits and vegetables are best for giving? Uh, so if you're listening to this now, we're assuming that you have missed the window for planting spring vegetables for giving. So we're gonna focus on those summer and fall crops that work best for emergency food providers. So in putting together this list, we consulted with emergency food providers with whom we partner um, and got some real general characteristics about produce that they love to receive. Um, please keep in mind that your local organization may have um, a different wish list, um, and that's really based on the clients that they serve, as well as their organizational capacity for things like refrigeration, um, where they're located, and the frequency of which they distribute food. Um, so the best thing to do is to find out what your local organization may want or need, and again, we'll give you those resources on how you connect with those lo local organizations um, after you register on the Grow and Give website. But in general, the great produce to donate is produce that um, 
when the emergency food provider receives it, it's easy to keep fresh, it's easy for them to package for donation and distribution, and it's recognizable. Um, so big items like winter squash and melons and tree fruit are really popular. Uh, we wanna stick with those tomatoes that are, are sturdy, so no cherry tomatoes or heirlooms that will crush. And then fun miscellaneous things are welcome, like eggplant, and uh, tomatillas, uh, but stay away from any of those peppers that are really insanely hot. So this is a list of produce that um, is really fun to grow and really fun to eat, but it actually can be kind of a challenge for emergency food providers to receive and store and distribute um, safely. Um, so they really fall into three main characteristics. We'd like to avoid produce that's difficult for the emergency food provider to keep fresh um, or to distribute in a way that keeps it fresh. And so keep in mind that these organizations are often run with a, a shoe, on a shoestring with limited volunteers. And so bagging or sub packaging this food uh, to keep it safe is, is probably going to be difficult. And so that produce is typically microgreens or delicate greens. Uh, even green onions can be a challenge herbs and berries. Um, we also want to avoid produce that crushes easily. Um, as I said, that was cherry or heirloom tomatoes or even perfectly ripe tree fruit. Um, oftentimes this produce will get put into a bag and then sometimes put into a pretty large food box. And so it can get uh, pretty beat up by the time it gets home. And then finally, we'd like to avoid uh, produce that can be challenging to a novel cook. So we don't wanna generalize about who is going to a food pantry because they come from all back walks of life with backgrounds. Um, so we, we wanna make sure we're not assuming that people have a fully equipped kitchen, um, that they have experience or a strong comfort level in, in preparing food in general, and then that they have experience in handling kind of that unusual produce. And so if you're really into growing broccoli rob and leeks, um, consider don donating those to a, a neighbor or a friend along with one of your favorite recipes. And if you're um, looking for recipes that you would like to um, give along with your produce to uh, emergency food providers, Extension has developed some nice recipes on how to incorporate garden produce um, into, uh, along with products that are pretty commonly received at um, food banks. And so if you're interested in getting those recipes, please email us at growandgive at colostate.edu. So we want to make sure that the food that you donate is uh, safe for people to eat, um, not only for the people who are receiving your food, but for your own family. Uh, so there's five main areas that we think about when we think about produce safety, um, and that's soil, water, both the water that we use for growing and the water we use after harvest, animals, uh, surfaces and containers, and people. So today we're gonna go over um, the things that you can do now to ensure that your food is safe. And then the other areas, especially those concerning harvest, we're gonna go over in a future presentation. There are three things to work on right now uh, to ensure that your garden is safe. Uh, the first is the soil. So you wanna make sure that you're amending your soil with compost or manure that's been fully composted or purchased from a trusted commercial source. Uh, you never wanna add raw manure or pet feces to your soil. Uh, it just introduces way too many harmful microorganisms um, that can uh, make people sick. The other source of problems could be water. So if you're using a non-potable water, such as um, that from a ditch or a well, uh, you should consider watering with a drip line or a soaker hose rather than from overhead. Um, overhead watering with this type of water can introduce microorganisms uh, on the surface of, of your uh, fruit or your vegetables. And then finally, animals. Uh, you need to take steps to keep your animals, um, including your pets, out of your garden so that they don't destroy your crops. Or uh, more importantly, we wanna keep that poop out of the garden. If you want to uh, learn more about this topic, there's a really great resource that I've put at the bottom of the slide 
Um, this gives you a lot of tips on how to keep your garden safe as well as keeping a community garden safe. So I hope you'll visit that. So I just wanna end by saying, um, I'm so excited that you're a part of uh, this project. Thank you for committing to this project at this crazy time we're living in and in this place. Uh, please remember that wherever you are in Colorado, um, extension is local, that we're here for you. And please stay in touch by emailing us at growandgive at colostate.edu.